Okay, so as I said, um, the the codes will be posted here. So for today, we are our objectives is basically dealing with the time marching problem. Um, we will start with initializing a problem. What we need to do for uh, defining time marching, and then how we can, if we have time in the end, how we can interact with the life simulation via our um, via our <coughs> graphical user interface. So everybody can see the entire screen, or was it just that one window that was shared? It's just the one window. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So what we talked about so far, uh, when we calculated the uh, Julia set in the previous session was that we we had a canvas that we wanted to draw on and later on we changed the canvas into uh, into the output of the shader instead of writing it to the canvas we posted the, a, the results into a data structure that was called a texture and the texture was basically just a matrix of data that was storing the pixel colors for uh, for that results output <laughs> so each of these matrix points would represent a pixel on the on the texture and then we we had the with the, the data that we wanted to to solve <laughs> and then this texture was sent into the plotting algorithm uh, the plotting and then that texture was represented and uh, visualized on the screen or uh, basically one of the canvases that we had on the screen. So now we want to solve a time marching problem. Um, and as an example of the time marching problem, I'm going to start with the simple heat equation that the, the derivative of u with respect to time is some diffusion coefficient times the uh, second derivative in the space, uh, basically the Laplacian of u times the times the diffusion coefficient, which can be written as uh, basically partial squared of u, uh, partial squared of x plus uh, partial squared of u to partial squared of y. <laughs> so. In order to do this, uh, the first thing that I have is um, I need to, uh, if I want to do an Euler uh, time marching problem, uh, the first thing is to calculate this derivative. And basically, I can say that the derivative of u at time t can be approximated by the derivative at time step n plus 1 minus the derivative at time step n divided by delta t if i have the value as a function of u i can simply say that u at time step n plus one is equal to uh, u at time step n plus that delta t times derivative uh, times the value of the derivative at uh, that time step. <laughs> and I can do that for all the locations i and j in a space, where I would represent the, the location in x, i and j. So the index i would run in that direction, and the index j would run in the other direction. So that would determine my my time stepping if i had this value of, of f of u and simply if i had this f uh, that is the derivative as a function on the space in in i and j point i and j and i can have this one at time step n as well so the superscripts are referring to the to the time step number i and j's at the bottom are referring to basically 
the location in space. And for the for the derivative in space, I could which which would be basically the time derivative that I want to have it is also a derivative in space is a function of space. I could use a central differencing scheme, saying that f of i and j at time step n is basically uh, diffusion times the Laplacian of u at the point i and j in space. That could be written simply as the diffusion times u of i plus 1 minus 2 times u of i plus u of i minus 1, all of them at point j, divided by delta x squared, all of these are at time step n, plus the same thing in the j direction, i and j plus 1, minus 2 times u i and j, plus u i and j minus 1 divided by delta y squared. Um, the important part is that, as you can see, this, this f can be written totally as a function uh, at the values at time step n. And if I had a point i and j in a space like so there, the dependency for the next time step would be on these pixels that are around it. This pixel, this pixel, this pixel, and this pixel would calculate the next time step pixel. So what I can do for solving this problem, as I can see here, if I have... I have a recipe now that I can stop at start at time step n. U of i and j are known at time step n. I can determine the derivative at time derivative of u at time step n as a function of all the values that are at time step n. And then subsequently this value is determined. And if I have that, then I can calculate a new pixel value. So basically I can start with the texture for time step n, and I can march it to the time step n plus 1. Because I have a recipe for all the pixels right now, I, all the pixels right now, I can go to the time step n plus 1. And then I can use that time step n plus 1 and march it again to go to n plus 2, and then march it again to go to n plus 3, n plus 4, and n plus 5, and so on and so forth. Okay. n plus 2. No. Plus 2. Plus 5. You can see that now we have basically some sort of a recipe that goes, um, that is taking everything uh, one time step forward uh, from one image and then from the same image back to the previous one, previous image, we march the solution again. So if we separate these um, top ones, let's say, these ones that they get um, even time steps and then separate the ones that are at the bottom for the odd time steps. You can see we can have two different recipes that they get one image as input and always produce an odd time step, and the other one gets an even time step and produces an odd number time step. So usually in, in the 
um, in the serial codes, what you have is that you update everything and you overwrite the previous time step to the next one, or you change the name of the um, the variables, uh, the old and the new. In C, you can easily change the pointers, and then you can continue doing and marching and using the same recipe. In WebGL, if you want to change the input and output of the shader, what will happen is that it, it will become very time consuming to attach a different uh, texture as an input to the shader and a different um, texture as an output to the shader. If you start swapping them, it is very time consuming. It's almost as time consuming as um, doing one complete time step. So instead of doing that, what we usually do, we separate these two time steps. So what I'm going to do today is basically I'm going to start implementing this, this simple concept that I explained here uh, into, into action. So what we are going to do at the beginning, we are going to uh, Uh, we are going to start with this Julia said example that we had from the previous class and we we'll start changing it. Uh, so we had a shader that we want to we want to rewrite basically. So we don't need any of these stuff anymore. Um, we, we are not going to deal with complex numbers for this example and we can we can empty the entire body of the, the shader. Uh, we don't need radius and math anymore. And our plotting and solve and visualize can change later on. Our graphical user interface, whatever we had added before, can be removed. Okay, so it becomes a very, very very small starting point for us. We can actually remove the entire Julia solver because, because we don't need it right now anymore. It's going to change completely. So we learn how to define textures. What we need is actually two sets of textures because we want to have one for the uh, even time steps uh, that I call it F color. And we want to have another color for the second set of colors. So the first. Could you uh, colors. could you bump up your font size some? Yes, yes, sure, sure. Thank you for thanks. Is it good now? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for reminding me. Okay. Basically, what we started to do is we started to define two textures. And those two textures are used basically to um, to represent these two sets of images that we are going to swap. Uh, but before we start doing any sort of solution, we need to actually initialize our uh, problem. And to initialize the problem, we can we can use a shader like before. So I let me make this one a little bit larger, maybe. Like better than before, so that I can have good side side by side. Okay. So we want to color these two um, basically textures to, to initialize both of them at the same time. We don't need to initialize both of them, but let's do it anyway so that we uh, learn about the layouts again. Location, zero. We want to calculate a color one and for one, we want to calculate a second set of color. 
And the reason is that we have two textures. I want to color both of them. So what we need to define, maybe we can define one variable for both of them. And we set all of them for this moment to be zero. So everything is right now initialized to zero. Color one can be set to color. Color two can be also set to color. Basically, both of them are initialized to zero. The reason that I separated the two is that I want to, you want to assign the same values to both of them. Just in case we initialize the solution, we want the same values to be uh, assigned to, to both of them. And then the next thing we want to do is we want to uh, plot these colors instead of the sorry, the textures that we had before. So we had a we had a color texture. Now we want to maybe plot F color here and the red channel of it. We need to initialize. We need to write a solver based on this gradient that we defined. Maybe we can change the the handle of it to something more meaningful, maybe in it, uh, the idea of it. So we can have an init solver. So again, we can use the solver definition. And each solver requires a fragment shader. Fragment shader that its source is this in each section that we defined on the right doesn't have any uniforms right now but it has a couple of targets that we want to color color one its location is zero and the target that we want to use for coloring is the F color and the next one is color 2 at location 1 that we want to write on the second set of the color that defines our solver completely um, what is off is my is in here. So our initialization is complete and we can render that. And after we render that, we can also render the plot to make sure the results can be seen in our, in our code. So let's go to the code that we have right now I have you should see just the blank screen right here and make the console a little bit larger with no errors we can we can set maybe at the center of the screen of the of the domain when the pixel coordinate distance is less than maybe 0.1 we want the red channel of this color to be the one let's see if texture is working correctly um, the maximum value for the Julia set was 30 we are no longer working with the Julia set so we can set it to 1 now okay so you see the color is correctly set the next thing that I want to do is actually start implementing 
one of those solvers that I was talking about is for time stepping, this was our initialization. For our time stepping, we need to have a, a different shader that brings a texture inside and produces a color for each pixel of the new uh, shader. So what we, we do is to make our life easier, we just copy the initial conditions so that we don't need to rewrite everything. And we start modifying a little bit. So this is no longer our initialization, the, the new copy that we generated. Maybe we can call it um, a time marching algorithm. Maybe we call it march. So I didn't delete the first one. The init is still there. I created another copy for marching. Okay. Our marching calculates only one color. And I call it maybe output color. Output color. And what it can bring in, we want to bring in a texture into this function, into this fragment. So the textures, they have to come in as a uniform and their type inside the shader is called a sampler 2D. So I say, I want to bring an input texture into into this shader. So I'm bringing an input texture into the shader. I remove these parts, not to cause any problems. To and I define a couple of stuff. So for example, the U variable, whenever I call it, I want it to be replaced by a color that R. So basically, I don't have to worry about which kind of channel that that variable was in. <clears throat> and I can define a vec4. So to read the center of the pixel, I use this function texture. And what this function does is that if I pass an input texture, the next value that I have to pass to this function is that what pixel of it I want to read. And the way that it reads the pixel color is that I have to pass the coordinate of the center of the pixel exactly as the next one. And I can pass as the coordinate of the center of the pixel as the exactly coordinate of the of the fragment here so that I can read what was the value of the texture on that uh, on my own location here in this particular. So that's good. At the end of it, when I'm done updating this color, so this color that I bring in, I want to manipulate it. And when I'm done, I want to write it to the output color. So I put the output color to be just equal to color. Right now we are not manipulating anything. We're just passing everything to be sent to the output. And I want to use this recipe to define a solver by that. So we define the initial conditions there. The next thing that I want to calculate is, remember we had an even and odd. We can have like, and we have F color and S color, I can have an F march, which is the first set of the marching steps that we need to take. New Abubu solver, and it has to have a fragment shader. And the fragment shader source is this march ID that we passed over there. And it has a bunch of uniforms. The first uniform that I have to pass is this in texture that I had over there. Its type is a texture. 
and its value is the f color that I passed. So I had two sets of textures, f color and uh, s color. The f color is passed as the as the input to this shader. And then I can have a bunch of targets, but here we have only one. And the name is output color that we chose over there. I can put it here, color. To write the location of it, which is zero. And the target, which I'm going to write on the S color. We can do a marching here. If I render it, it basically reads the first color, writes the second color. And just to make things interesting, I start um, just coloring the S color there. So let's rerun the program. Basically, right now, nothing should change because the, the texture, as it's coming in, it's going out. So what we can see is no color was changed and there was no problem compiling the code. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to do a little bit of manipulations here. So for example, if u was less than 0.5, before I go to there uh, to, to march the problem, I want to show you that things can change now. u, we set it to 1, and if it was more than 0.5, we want to set it to 0. Basically, the red channel of us, if it was more than 0.5, it will become less than 0.5 and vice versa. So whatever is red uh, should become blue and vice versa. So let's see if it happens. You see it's working. It's swapping the colors. So the values are coming from, from the F color and they are written into the S color. So it's working. And now I can, I can make the second set. So basically the second set, if, if I go back to the A, You remember we were we needed even steps and odd steps for the even steps this set was the input and this set was the output for the odd steps this set was the input and this set was the output so basically i have the recipe for changing the colors all i have to do is to swap the roles in the same shader with a second solver that changes the input as the, the input as the output. So if after this one, right now I'm not calling the second set of the solver. If I run it, right now it's just the first set that is doing the changes. But if I run the second one, which is with the name S, if I plot the F color instead of the S color, I should be able to see that everything was moved back to what it was because the colors, this one becomes blue and the blue becomes red. In the next step, the red becomes blue and the, and the, and the blue becomes red again. So now, basically, these two steps create a two-time step marching for us. So our marching algorithm can be basically this two steps run in sequence. So I can define a function basically by these ones. Whenever these two are run in sequence, they complete two time steps for us. So remember, 
The reason is that we don't want to just simply change the role of these two in the same solver, but we want to have two subsequent solvers that they are using the same code, the same shader code. They are using just the roles of the, the variables are swapped in the two, um, in the two solvers. Now we can do a little bit of uh, changes to actually start doing uh, the, the implementation that we wanted to do. So in order to do that, uh, this little part that I explained uh, that was basically the diffusion part that we were reading the neighbors, the part. We needed the neighbors here to be able to calculate the value of the Laplacian. So we had to read the value of the neighbors here. So what we have done so far, we have successfully with with the CC part, we have successfully read this, this section at the center of the pixel that we are located. What we need to do is we need to move one pixel over to the right, left, um, up and down uh, directions. So remember I said the texture function uh, reads the uh, center of the pixel. <laughs> so if I am if I'm coloring this fragment and I need the neighbors, I have to move over by the width of exactly one pixel to be able to to do this. But the the function goes from zero and zero in this corner to one and one in that corner. So that's the x direction of it. That's the y direction of it. And now probably it becomes clear why I was um, determining the uh, the vertex shader the way that I was defining it, why I was defining that CC coordinate, because I want to be able to access the these textures um, easily. The width of uh, one pixel, so this width if we require it, the width of, width of one pixel is exactly uh, one divided by divided by the total number of pixels that we have over there. So if that one is W number of pixels, one divided by W would give us exactly the length in this coordinate system that we need to move one pixel over or one pixel to the left. Also, if the height is h, the amount that we need to go up to reach the center of the next pixel is exactly the total length, which is one, divided by the number of pixels in the y direction. I call it n of y. have n pixels in the x direction, n pixels in the y direction, the distance that I have to move up and down is 1 over n of x. So luckily, the uh, shader can give us some information about the textures that we are bringing in. Uh, we can read the uh, size of the texture inside the inside the shader and that uses this function called texture size. I can have a size variable that gives the uh, the width and height of the texture for me and I have to do a texture convert a vector 2 conversion because the number that it returns is an integer and I need a float texture size in texture hmm. this zero is the level of detail that's some graphic stuff we always pass zero to it because we, we are not using it. 
as you uh, in there. The, the amount that we want to move in the x direction is basically, we said, it's this vector. This is our directional vector in the x direction or the i vector, unit vector in the x direction, y divided by the size. Basically, we need to divide everything by size x, but since this is an element-wise division, um, size x, dividing by size x or dividing by size doesn't matter because the other element is just zero. And our j vector is zero and divided by by the size. So now we can do the uh, Laplacian part that we were concerned about. We wanted to calculate this part, uh, ui plus 1 i minus 1, j plus 1, j minus 1. And if we assume that delta x and delta y are equal, then minus 4 times the central value. So I can define a Laplacian here, vector 4 Laplacian, that I can have texture in texture from the center I want to go one pixel to the left. Texture and texture. One pixel to the right. One pixel up. And one pixel down. And Subtract four times the center of the pixel. And then the derivative of u with respect to time would be this Laplacian times r divided by delta x squared. Let's say the size of the domain is 10, then dx would be 10 divided by size in x. Divided by delta x squared. times the diffusion coefficient, right? And I could march the solution by dt, so the previous value, the new value that I calculate based on this is the previous value times delta t times amount of this derivative that we calculated over there. So it will be u, previous u plus delta t times derivative of u with respect to time, du to dt. Okay, so these two recipes back-to-back, uh, -back, one of them takes the uh, image from the even time steps and writes it to the odd time steps, and the, the next one takes the odd color and sends it to the to the even colors, whatever you want to call them. So in order to do this marching, I have to do, I have to be calling this marching function again and again, and I have to be rendering the results. So in order to run the function, all I have to do is define a function that runs <coughs> marches the solution, and then 
renders the plotting algorithm. And after I create the graphical interface, I can call this run. But right now this is calling the function run only once. If I want to continuously march the solution whenever I'm done with the plotting, I have to be rerunning re the function. So this request animation frame make sure after plotting is done, complete with plotting, we can recall the function again and it will keep running the, the solution, sorry. So this is an infinite loop that we create by calling this once, we are marching the solution continuously. So let's see if we didn't introduce any errors. Uh, there was no DT. Let's define DT here as DS point zero one and diffusion coefficient point zero zero one. Okay, things are changing, but very slowly. So the problem is that right now the plotting algorithm is the bottleneck. We don't need to be plotting the solution every time step. We need to be plotting it maybe every once in a while when the solution has significantly changed. So we can be skipping several of these plottings if we say, for example, uh, run this loop 40 times. meaning march the solution by 80 time a step. Each time we call march, the solution is marched two time steps. Run from the odd to the even and then back from the odd to the, one from the odd to the even and one from the even to the odd. So now I can see the solution is marching much faster and that solution is diffusing into the domain. We, if you want to have some sort of control when the solution is running and when the solution is not running, in this uh, section environment, you can add a variable running that is initially false. And you can add it to the graphical user interface. It will, by seeing that it's a Boolean, it will immediately understand that if you add it, it should be a checkbox. And instead of um, keep running the solution, we can check if we are running, then we, we actually go to this loop of running this stuff. Otherwise, we just keep plotting the same solution. Do that. Did I write false wrong at the beginning? Oh, to be Boolean. I wrote it as a pause the solution now. <laughs> Okay, it's good. We can we can add uh, other stuff to be brought in if we want to. We want to change them through the uh, graphical user interface. For example, what is the delta t and stuff like that. And if we want to interact with this code, we can we can start changing it a little bit uh, by introducing this this. DT and diffusion coefficient as maybe maybe things that are uniforms. So I can set the time step there, diffusion coefficient to be 0 0.001 0 there. I can I can change these ones to uniforms that I can bring from outside and diffusion coefficient 
By the way, you can define them like this by defining them in one go, like so. Um, and then pass them as uniforms here. So you can say that dt is of type load and its value is environment dt and diffusion coefficient of type load and its value is environment coefficient. And what you need to make sure is that both of these guys are passed to the second set solver as well. So they are receiving the same copies for, for the marching algorithm. But do that, same sort of thing is achieved, but the values are now sent from the, from the CPU there. Now to make things a little bit more interesting, I can change this um, code into um, into the Pizunaguma model, which is a reaction diffusion model, by assigning the second variable v into the into the green channel of it uh, of the color that we we are calculating. So the texture we calculated a color based on that, and the red channel of it, we, as, we had assigned it to U, now we can assign the green channel of it to, to V. So this is defined, not defined. And the formulation for the uh, Fitsu Nagumo model is this, U minus one minus U, U minus A, uh, minus v and then at the bottom for the second value variable v is just a, a ordinary differential equation maybe I should make it larger so ordinary differential equation where v is a function of u and, and v so in on top of the diffusion part that we had here we have a reaction part as well. <laughs> so I can start adding um, adding the variables to the derivative of u, like so that we had here, derivative of u was, uh, was uh, we had it until here, we can add the rest of it plus u, U times one minus <clears throat> minus two one minus U uh, times uh, U minus A minus V and we can have a flow derivative of V with respect to T to be um, epsilon times V times U minus V. The where we have A to be point 0.1 B to be 0.3 and epsilon to be 0 0.01. No errors so far. Now that we have changed everything into reaction diffusion equation, now an activation wave can travel uh, to the domain. So, 
The next part that I can quickly mention is what if I wanted to change, for example, this A with a uniform here. So if I added a uniform to the set A that I'm sending from outside, maybe I defined a, the A variable here. Um, A was point one, I believe. One. And here on top of DT, we had A of five float and added A here. We have to make sure that we add the same thing in the uniforms for the second set. And then when we added it to the panel, right now we are just passing it through there. A, we turned it into a uniform, so we need to make sure that we comment out this part. Let's see if we have it. Now if we change it, the changes need to be updated in the solvers. So we can have this part that unchange. We want to run a function and that function is basically saying that F March its uniforms and its uniforms A A's value needs to be updated to the new value of A in the environment. We need to do the same thing for the S March. So both of the sets of the solvers for the even and odd time steps that we defined uh, should be should be updated. If I do that now, mid simulation I can start changing this A. Other one. back I think one of the numbers that I implemented is incorrect This has a different cheat sheet. Anyways, you can you can change these um, these values using the uh, the graphical interface. Um, wanted to talk about debugging using the um, using the console, but I think enough for today. So what we talked today in short if we want to explain was basically um, 
define a time marching algorithm based on just one shader. Uh, the colors were coming in as an input texture and going in as an output texture. The input was here through the uniforms, F color and S color. And as we explained in the, the, go. In, the um, in the notes here, here in the notes here basically the inputs were two textures that were going from even steps to the odd steps and even steps and odd steps and these would march the solution from time step zero all the way forward to the time um, in the next session what we will talk about i think uh, a little bit in more detail we will talk about a little bit about debugging how we can um, write these parts a little bit more elegantly because as you notice as i was trying to add more and more uniforms i had to remember that all of these uniforms had to be added into two different solvers uh, we can do it in a more uh, refined way so that it can automatically be done uh, so that we don't make any mistakes but the point was that i wanted you to remember that oh, these two solvers form the full time marching algorithm and the reason that we separated the two setups was that uh, swapping the roles of these two in the same solver uh, would slow down the, the computation significantly I think it's a, it's a good point to stop at this section here. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Um, if you have more than four variables in your system, do you just increase the number of textures you use? Yes. So in, uh, if, you, if you notice, the part that we were defining our input, uh, our initial conditions, we actually had two sets of colors that were being calculated, right? That we were sending and initializing two textures at the same time. So what we can do is in the following sessions, we can have uh, models that actually have more than four sets of uh, variables in them. And you would see basically this number here would keep growing uh, it can go up to eight, and then the number of input textures as well as the output textures would grow uh, together. Okay. Is there a concern about running out of texture memory or something like that? Like um, weaker graphics cards not have enough it memory? It's a, it's a graphic card dependent um, issue. If you run in a WebGL report, version 2 tells you that for the solvers you can have a maximum of eight color attachments so you can have maximum of eight colors on this gpu as the output colors but the maximum image units so for the fragment shaders you can see there are some some texture images that you can be included and sent into the texture uh, into the into the shader so that number is 16 that you can send into a single single uh, shader on this machine. Um, I think on a Windows machine, it's it's both graphic card dependent and the driver depend and it's the driver dependent. So on the same um, machine um, on Windows and Linux, I get different numbers for this uh, for the same sort of graphic card. So it depends on the driver as well that you are using so uh, this number varies between 30 32 on the machines that i have seen and 16 but i haven't seen any numbers smaller than 16 even on cell phones for the input images so if you okay. go beyond the eight for the calculation of these you have to break your solver into two different shaders that are uh, calculating the same time step. 
Okay. So, so wait, color attachments that corresponds to like the number of the output of targets, layers, the number output of cards. output targets, yeah, that you have, and the fragment shader, the maximum image units that you see over there, it refers to, and maybe I make it larger so that you can see. The maximum image units or texture image units that you see refers to that uniform sampler 2Ds that you're bringing in. The texture okay. sizes also have uh, limitations. So how big your texture can be is also dependent on the graphic card that you can have and the driver. So the maximum texture size you can see is he here is 16,000 by 16,000. Uh, for NVIDIA on the under cards, go to NVIDIA here and choose one of the graphic cards. Let's I can choose, find one of the drives platforms. Go to the GeForce. And I can choose one of them. Detail line. Okay. So if you go to these specs, And view the full specs. There is a there is a texture size limit. Uh, previously, they had to they had a size limit. The video memory. Okay, I guess they are not. They are no longer providing those ones to the users. But previously you could see the, tech, the maximum texture size that would be handled. Okay. It's sometimes called maximum resolution. I can't find it anymore. There is a maximum resolution that the, 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 the graphic cards can handle for the texture units. <clears throat> because the textures are actually uh, processed by the graphic card on its own. Uh, they they have additional features that we haven't talked about. You, the graphic card automatically does filtering on them. It can do interpolations and extrapolations uh, on the on the uh, pixels. Um, so they are useful if for for some of the applications that we are going to use later on. And sometimes you need to be aware of them, which one you are choosing. <clears throat> But all of them are basically, uh, there are dedicated units on the GPU that does all of those operations, makes them really fast. Also, um, using textures as, as data structures, because there are uh, specific functions for the textures, makes them really, really fast uh, as compared to regular arrays that you can use on CUDA, for example. Uh, most of the people who are programming and they start programming with CUDA, they start using the, the traditional arrays on them. If you use textures, you would see that you can you can get faster faster simulations, but sometimes the textures need to be defined in a certain way and they have to be optimized in CUDA. Whereas in WebGL, they, the driver decides what is what is best implementation for that memory unit. And anyway, we are dealing with just a, um, a rectangular uh, data structure. Most of the time, even square. So we are we are really uh, in good shape doing our calculations. Okay, thanks. Good to know. You're welcome. Uh, one one thing that makes the simulations faster is using the size of the textures. If these sizes are uh, powers uh, of two, uh, the GPUs usually perform much better on them than if you had, for example, 
513 instead of 502. Uh, they perform much better because they match uh, the the GPU units that are available there, they are all powers of two, so it can really optimize the the domain decomposition there to to be processed. So remember that this is one of those things that can change your performance rather drastically. So oh, I have one more question. Um, sure. I might have missed it, but you didn't define boundary conditions, as far as I could tell. So how no. does this handle that? Is just anything outside of the range automatically zero or something like that? No, this one is actually using a mirror filtering. So the, that's one of the parts that I didn't talk about it and we will talk about it later, uh, is how we are applying uh, boundary conditions. That's a very good observation. That Right now, we are having a zero flux boundary condition everywhere by default. And the way that it's done is basically open. So when we are reading um, an image and we are trying to, let's say we are at this pixel here, and we want to read something that is here that doesn't exist, um, it automatically assumes that if something was written like F here, the image is mirrored here, like so. So the same pixel is repeated over there. And what does what that does is that actually when you're doing your second derivative with respect to X, when you substitute numbers like that, when you're calculating you get a second order accurate partial u to partial x equal to zero with second order accuracy. So what you can do is actually, we will talk about it, that you can use this filtering technique for, for other special boundary conditions. If your boundary condition is really specific and doesn't form, uh, doesn't fit any of those um, underlying conditions, you have to then separate the nodes that are inside from those ones who are boundary nodes and write boundary conditions explicitly in, in the data. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've definitely seen things where they set boundary conditions explicitly. It's just usually they like how to, and then this is cool that you can ignore it if you like. Yeah. For, for cardiac applications, it's very handy that it, something like this is already included, so you don't need to. <laughs> so, um, because you're using this mirroring, it kind of means that if we want to include a diffusion tensor and we want no flux, that implementation becomes a bit more complicated. Correct. Yeah, okay. Is that already considered in the library or is that sort of ongoing? Um, I haven't considered it as a, as a concern in the library itself because these are, these are some these are features that are already available on the GPU and we are just utilizing them. Like those are not features that are in the GPU and if you want to apply boundary conditions on any any other domain like like that, you have to actually um, uh, apply it on your own. Okay. Um, but for the zero flux boundary condition, I think it doesn't depend on the on the tensor itself because what you need to do is you need to satisfy this condition you need to you need to satisfy what you have here partial u to partial x equal to 0 uh, first you apply this condition and then the results are are passed for your ghost nodes here so whether you have a diffusion tensor or not the same condition needs to be satisfied for the zero flux that the derivative with respect to x is zero in that direction. And it leads to the same same sort of 
implementation. As, as far as I remember correctly for the ghost notes. Um, maybe, maybe for the corners, I don't know. It could be a problem. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Anything else? No? No more questions? Stop the recording.